Uh, and then we've also, of course, got uh, other distinguished panelists uh, here. George Young, delighted to see you, George, uh, who was uh, a housing minister himself. Uh, and he's almost always a minister uh, until very recently uh, and a great friend and supporter uh, of um, uh, the, the, those progressive causes that we've always championed in the Conservative side, the party around housing and so on. My good friend and colleague, Bob Blackman, uh, who's the, the senior Conservative member of, of the Communities and Local Government, Housing, Housing Communities and Local Government Select Committee uh, and the MP uh, for Harrow East, a long colleague and friend from London politics days going back a long way. Simon Randall, who I'll introduce in a moment, who also cut his teeth in Bromley politics uh, as the, the deputy leader of Bromley Council, as well as being a very distinguished uh, solicitor and significant housing expert. And also we hear, we'll be hearing from Judith Barnes and uh, Sarah Ball. So many thanks, all people with real expertise in this housing field. So we're gonna start off without more ado um, with Simon, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Can I first of all thank the Society for publishing uh, my uh, work um, and to all those who've helped in any way with the research which uh, was undertaken. I'm going to talk about four issues very briefly. First of all, my belief that social housing should be regarded as an investment for the public. Secondly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the low cost home ownership scheme, which I refer to. Thirdly, a bit about the role of housing associations because they are so important in terms of the number of social homes they own. Then lastly, to introduce institutional housing in, into social housing. I have behind me a poster which I picked up some years ago campaigning in the United States and I looked at some of the ways in which they provided social housing and I'll mention that in my last remark. So first of all, um, in the, the, any investment by government, uh, by public grants, should bring social housing as an investment. Um, and I therefore take the view that uh, when a local authority or when a housing association uh, is able to buy a property or develop a property in an area where those prices rise, they should, as an investment, be able to sell those properties and reinvest in other opportunities. I've given an example of what occurred in Islington. Every day I walk uh, and collect my newspaper past a street that shall be nameless, where the local authority own uh, 17 of 25 grade one star list, no, no, grade one, grade two listed buildings built in 1828. And they bought them in the 1970s um, for figures of no more than 200,000 pounds. They are now worth a minimum of 2 million and indeed one or two of them probably up to 3 million. And since they hold a lot of these properties, if they were able to sell the properties, say two million pounds, they could build between six and 10 new two bedroom flats, excluding land costs and fees, uh, and build new properties rather than have to look after these older properties. And therefore, one of the main proposals I've got is that the government should implement the powers they have with one change, and that is to permit the local authority to use 100% of the sale proceeds for reinvestment. And that should equally apply to housing associations. Secondly, um, the low cost home ownership model is referred to rather widely in the pamphlet. For those who perhaps know me might realize this was a scheme which I devised uh, with Dennis Barkway, the previous council leader. I became leader when he stood down. Um, and that was a scheme whereby Bromley Council incorporated the land that they owned for a very low price and weights the builders built the properties and retain just their profit on the building costs. And I believe that that kind of scheme could well be introduced in combination with land value capture, uh, which the government are toying with, but not totally committed to. If they were to devise a scheme whereby land that uh, gets an increase in value 
a windfall from the granting and planning commission, they should ensure that for future schemes can be developed with a high percentage of low cost home ownership for those young people and young couples who can't afford it. The average age for the first time buyer in the country, sorry, in England is 33 years, and in London uh, it is uh, uh, 37 and rising. Um, I quote uh, what the uh, uh, picture on the front of my pamphlet said, that particular individual said, and this was of course some years ago, nearly 50, he said he wanted to buy his first home by the time he was 30, and he achieved his 30th birthday the day before he was given the keys of this house. Now that is of course quite late in those periods, but I think that is where we do need to devise schemes of that kind. I don't see uh, some of the other schemes like 95% mortgages as really being terribly sensible when the market is so fluid. The third area is housing associations. Housing associations, and I had the pleasure or the privilege of chairing two housing associations, including Broomley that took Bromley Council's housing stock. And 60% of today's social housing is run, is owned and managed by housing associations. They operate within a beneficial environment with 50% of their income guaranteed by the state through housing benefit or um, universal credit when that comes fully on stream. They benefit from tax uh, cuts through being charitable. And all of these uh, give of a, a, an organization which is run generally by very well-meaning experienced people, but perhaps inadequate regulation or inadequate attention being paid to some of the operations that they undertake. So my view is there should be a review of the activities of housing associations and perhaps the opportunities for them to consider floating some of their non-charitable works um, by getting other outside investment. The fourth issue, which is one where I undertook research when I was uh, in the United States, is increasing the institutional investment into social and indeed large uh, affordable housing generally. In the US, they most uh, of social housing is actually organized through real estate investment trusts or REITs. We have one or two, well, most of the commercial property uh, is owned by real estate investment trusts. And there are at the moment very few um, organizations that have REITs for residential property. Granger's is obviously one which is quoted, plus Unite, uh, which uh, provides student accommodation. But in the United States, there is very much wider investment in this type of housing. So much so that uh, people who live in a locality will support through their own personal investment, uh, investment a real estate investment trust. And I think that the government should try and encourage institutional investment into social and affordable housing, which is another means by which housing associations can build new homes. Uh, and that is what I hope could be achieved. So those are the four things that I think that are important in the pamphlet. Uh, and I know there are other issues, um, particularly in the one that I think is important, is that if we can have uh, low cost ownership throughout England, particularly in those areas where, housing, where land costs are so much smaller, then I think that is one way in which the party could therefore ensure that the North gets a fair share of the opportunities for low cost home ownership for young people and young couples. So many thanks for that. Uh, that, that that's really very useful as an introduction. It's a very, very helpful and very, very informative pamphlet. And I hope that those who haven't read it yet will do so um, because it opens up some great ideas. And uh, th thanks to Guy Sandhurst's work, we're publishing a number of pamphlets now to try and uh, influence the policy agenda uh, as the party moves forward. And this couldn't be a more important topic. Uh, so if I may, that may then uh, move to my uh, parliamentary colleague, my House of Commons colleague, uh, Bob Blackman, I think is next. Uh, and Bob, uh, again, is probably well known to many, um, uh, a former member of Brent, uh, former leader of Brent Council, um, uh, and also former member of the London Assembly. 
uh, where we serve together uh, and uh, uh, now, as I say, one of our uh, particular experts on the housing field uh, within the, uh, the House of Commons. So, Bob, over to you. OK, well, thank you, Sir Bob. And also uh, thank you, Simon, for that introduction to your pamphlet. I, I, I want to start on uh, a number of areas, but, but first and foremost, of course, we have a manifesto commitment to build 300,000 new homes a year uh, over the duration of the Parliament. Uh, and to put it in context, what we should also remember is that uh, only uh, last year we managed to build, I think it's 227,000 uh, mm. housing units, uh, which is the highest level for all but one of the last 30 years. Um, the reality is that, that, in actual fact, home ownership is a dream for many young people, particularly in London, but, but are shared across uh, the UK. And indeed, when we were talking during the introduction about uh, Harold Macmillan when he was housing minister, although he built 300,000 new homes a year, um, that, that wasn't the net figure uh, because we were demolishing slums in the East End and, and other places at the same time. So in actual fact, we, we've got to be realistic about what is achievable and how it can be achieved. Um, so one of the things I think is that, that we should change the rhetoric from being 300, building 300,000 new homes a year to providing 300,000 new homes a year. And one of the reasons why I think that's important is that under COVID-19, which we're all uh, living with now, um, the estimate in London and in many towns and cities is that commercial property will no longer be required in the volume that it has been. There is an opportunity, therefore, to convert existing commercial property to proper homes under decent standards with windows, proper space standards, uh, and the ability for to provide for family homes within commercial what were commercial premises, either by demolishing the commercial premises or converting them over. And I think that's one way we can add to the numbers of new homes uh, that we're providing. I also think that we've got to actually incentivize our housing associations to build more social housing. I have to say that in many conversations I've had with housing association chief executives, many are very keen to build new housing. Others are very content to say, we're very happy with the volume of housing we've got and we don't want to provide any more. I think the government can persuade and encourage a process to say, we will write off um, the uh, grants we've given you uh, that are currently on their books as loans, convert them to grants, which you'll never have to repay, provided you use that money to actually build new affordable social housing uh, in chain with your own ability to provide that housing. And we do so on the basis of, 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 of maybe spreading that over 10 years and saying we'll write off 10% of the um, loan that you've had over that 10 years, provided you use all of that money to build new homes uh, for sale and rent, uh, which I think is key. And the other thing that we have to think of, of course, is that the cost of land, particularly in London, but in other cities and towns, is probably half the cost of providing a new home. So we have to think of how do we provide decent homes which are affordable for people to either buy or rent. And my solution to this has been, and I keep hammering this, and I will keep hammering it to every audience that I can, is that public bodies, be they local authorities or government departments, should no longer sell land to the highest bidder. What we should do, and in much the same way as Simon was talking earlier, we should put that land to the good of, of providing housing directly commission that housing to be built and then uh, actually rent it at a proportion of the cost of building it as opposed to so-called market rents. This would make it affordable for people to be able to rent and we should enshrine as a proper conservative principle that on moving in an individual would have the absolute right to buy that property at the value it is on the day they move in and start paying rent when they can afford to do so. So if it's five years or 10 years time, they would then actually have an asset that they could acquire. 
Plus, we would then say to uh, the, the authority, all the proceeds gained under that right to buy should be then reinvested in the provision of new housing. So this would create a virtuous circle of providing new housing over an extended period of time and have the key point here that instead of charging uh, rents, because what happens at the moment is we sell our public land to the highest bidder. It then gets sold and sold on, sold on. Eventually someone builds the housing and comes back. Well, in order to make this work, we now have to charge this level of rent. People then move in and of course they can't afford to pay the rent. So what do they do? They claim housing benefit or universal credit and the taxpayer ends up subsidising the rent. Far better to have a rent that people can afford to pay either from their income or from their salary. So actually this would be a virtuous circle. Having done, I mean, I, I won't go into all the details, but having done some of the figures uh, around this, actually with a housing benefit bill of, uh, of the order of 27 billion pounds a year, this actually would be a much better way of providing housing at a price people could afford. Because one of the other problems about housing benefit is that people lose benefit pound for pound as they earn money. So it's a direct disincentive to work. So this would be a very sound conservative principle that, that we have. And equally true, the, the, the reality is that at the moment people used to, uh, as was said, uh, the average age at which people will buy their home, first home is now 37 in London, um, uh, above 30 elsewhere. The other consideration is that it used to be that the average uh, time you, one spent in a property was of the order of seven years. It's now over 20. So people do, don't buy and sell as often as they used to. Um, so that means, of course, it's harder and harder to get on the uh, ladder to buy a property or indeed uh, to rent. So I think that the solution that I've, 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 I've outlined in, uh, is one of the ways that we've got to do it. The other consideration is that when we're talking about 300,000 new, new homes being provided, we've got to consider that 90,000 of those need to be socially rented because those, are, those will be rents that people could afford to pay as opposed to our current position where we don't have any targets for socially rented accommodation. And the government quite rightly says we're building more council homes and most more socially rented homes than the last Labour government did. That's brilliant. But we're only talking about 12,000 units a year. I mean, it's a drop in the ocean compared to what is needed. And the knock on effect of this is, of course, that we end up with people sleeping rough. We end up with people sofa surfing. We end up with people unable to afford either the rent, and they certainly can't afford to buy a property. And our big problem is, and I have to say that this is our, our, our biggest problem of all, is that our switch of money from the Treasury to subsidise the provision of new housing for sale, which took place under George Osborne as Chancellor, a quite deliberate decision to do this, to encourage first-time buyers to buy, but moving the money away from socially rented accommodation, because I think that that was a mistake that we're now living with uh, as a direct result. Our other problem is, as a, as a government, uh, is that making decisions on these things today will not lead to the new housing tomorrow. It will take an extended period of time before we actually get to the provision of getting the housing uh, that we need. But if we don't make the decisions now, we won't have actually made any influence on the thing, uh, the, the whole position in the market until we get to the next general election. And our big, uh, my big concern is that governments of all persuasions do uh, interference in the market. And of course, we had the uh, interference of uh, the position of uh, help to buy. Mm -hmm. Virtually every home that's bought by a first time buyer is built under, bought under help to buy. That's a wonderful thing to encourage home ownership. The problem is that it's inflated prices uh, as a direct result. And, and what we've got to be clear of is we have to have, in my judgment, a clear strategy for how we're going to provide new social housing, new housing for people uh, that can afford to buy, encourage share, shared ownership uh, right the way through the whole process. So we have a housing revolution in this country that will enable people to say, 
the Conservatives are caring about people across the whole of society and enabling people to have a home of their own in a secure manner. I'll stop there, Bob, because otherwise I, um, other speakers won't get time. That is a really great overview of where we are from the, the politics of, of this. Uh, and I think you make the important point of a lot of us are great supporters of the right to buy uh, back in the in the 80s. Uh, but one of the issues was, uh, of course, the, the capital receipts weren't, in fact, recycled, as had been the original plan uh, of Hugh Rossi, uh, who was the, the housing minister that, uh, that, that thought it up uh, as a scheme. And of course, there's a consequence of that thereafter. And we are always going to need a stock of social housing. It's how best we deliver that. I think recognising that will, will, will set us up, up, up on, I think, a much firmer footing. Now, our next speaker is, in fact, himself a former housing minister and, and, and a very successful uh, and distinguished one. And that's George Young, your Lord Young uh, of Cookham. Uh, George, of course, was the housing minister from 90 uh, to 94, um, much at the same time as uh, as Bob and I were involved in London politics and Simon was doing some of the exciting things he's told us about uh, in, in, in Bromley. So uh, uh, George was uh, uh, really making a difference there. George, delighted to, uh, to see you with us uh, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and a pleasure to follow uh, Stuart and Bob Blackman with some really exciting, uh, relevant ideas about housing policy. And can I commend Stuart um, and the Society on this timely, well-informed and radical publication? which I hope will inform housing policy in this parliament. Can I pick up some points? First, there's a passing reference to Grenfell, which is a sort of shadow cast mm -hmm. over the housing market much more broadly than tower, mm. tower blocks. My own view is that if all else fails, the government is going to have to step in. We can't have mass personal bankruptcies and evictions and essential repairs to a large section of the housing stock left undone because nobody is legally liable to do that. Um, and I suggested um, uh, a few days ago in the Lords, um, following the, the, the precedent of the Housing Defect Act 1984, which I actually put on the statute book. Yeah. And this um, has a parallel. It rescued homeowners who had bought PRC houses, who had done all due diligence, and neither the solicitors nor the surveyors nor the house builders were legally liable. And the government stepped in and we paid for essential repairs. So there is a precedent. I think on Grenfell, we're probably going to need a package of measures with some low interest loans, some contributions from the house builders. And as I said, the government there is lender of last resort or grant maker of last resort. Uh, Bob reminded us just a moment ago, Bob Deal, about um, why local authorities weren't allowed to keep all the receipts. He's quite right. What happened was that the receipts clocked up in the showers where housing need was less and where the receipts weren't spent on housing. Yeah. And the inner cities, where the stock was in poor condition and demand was high, had very few receipts. So what we did, and it was very unpopular, we obliged the Shah districts to use part of their receipts to reduce their borrowing. And we then increased the borrowing of the inner city districts, thereby recycling the right to buy receipts on the basis of housing need. Good progressive Toryism, but not uh, popular at the time. Um, a word about social housing. There are two views about social housing. One mentioned in the report is that of the LGA, who said that social housing should be seen as a desirable long-term option for a home. The alternative view, which I tend to favour and to judge from the paper suggesting that we should review lifetime security for social tenants, Simon's view, is that social housing should be targeted on those in greatest need. And once those had got back on their feet, they should be encouraged to move out. Hence the support for the portable uh, right to buy. And it's just worth making the point that if you're on the waiting list, of course you're interested in how many new homes are built that year. You are eight times more likely to be rehoused through a relet than through a new build. And I don't think you spend enough energy promoting mobility through the housing stock as we do on you build when they both have the same impact on those in housing need. Now, social landlords have historically resisted uh, this approach, which casts them as houses of last resort. It deprives them of the stable and balanced community they would prefer to manage. And that debate's going to run and run. But my view, as I said, is to use the portable right to buy and to, have, to encourage people to move on uh, either through the right to buy or through other opportunities for low cost home ownership or access to some of the Broomley type schemes mentioned in the paper. 
I, I raised an eyebrow at the paper's suggestion that investment in housing should be focused on areas with low values to maximise output. I understand the argument, but it sits uneasily with the government's planning white paper, which seeks to focus investment in areas where people want to live, <coughs> which tend to be high value, but I go along with some of the other criticisms of the white paper. Finally, um, to pick up a point that Simon made about REITs. Historically, pension funds and insurance companies haven't invested in equities. So I haven't invested in residential property. They've invested in equities, fixed interest securities, commercial property, but they haven't invested in residential property, which would actually <clears throat> have given them very good returns, both in capital values and in dynamized rents. Now it's beginning to change. But like, like Simon, I'd like to see the private rented sector more dominated by long-term institutional investors with professional management and long leases for tenants. And I'd like to see the sector less exposed to the private landlord, many of whom are excellent, but some not. And what I would like to see is REITs on the same basis as investment trusts, uh, raising funds for investment. But the tweak that I would make would be to say to the private landlord, we will buy your home with a sitting tenant and we will give you shares in the investment trust and you do a deal with the treasury whereby at that point there is no exposure to capital gains tax they only pay capital gains tax if and when they dispose of their property their shares in the REITs now from the private landlord's point of view that's a very good deal he remains exposed to the residential sector rising capital values with rents uh, also going up but he doesn't have all the hassle of management. And you can then move on to moving away from six month assured tenancies, which is the model at the moment, to much longer uh, tenancy agreements because the uh, investment trust uh, can take a long-term view. So that is the structural change um, that I would like to uh, see. There are many other points, but I'm conscious that we are already running behind time. So I'm going to pause there, Bob, and let you hand over okay. to the next speaker. Well, that, that, thanks indeed, George, and that, 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 that's great stuff. And glad you mentioned, Graham Fogg, because I think mm -hmm. all of us who are in, in Parliament have come across the in our own constituencies. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think you're right, you know, if, if the regulatory regime was inadequate for whatever reason, um, despite the best endeavours of uh, individuals, then that's a failure of governance. Uh, and ultimately, government will have to pick up the tab, even if it's years after. Um, uh, the the events which gave rise to it. I think it's an important point that we that we make. So next we're going to move. I think you're Ju Judith. You're next. I think I'll I'll, I'll, I'll cheer now. Lovely. Thank you. Order. Um, several speakers have already covered uh, right to yes. right. Uh, and I just want to say a few words about the proposal in the yeah. uh, pamphlet. I'm going to focus on the rather more radical version, and people can shoot it down if they think it's maybe a bit of a bold suggestion in some free terms. Um, right to buy is, I think, 40 years old this year. Um, so it's really stood the test of time. It's given hundreds of thousands of people who might not otherwise have had a chance, a chance to buy a home, the chance to get in there and get one. Um, so it's been a very, very practical means of redistributing wealth, redistributing wealth in a way that's expanded the property owning democracy, which we all support as uh, conservatives. But as, as people have pointed out, it has the downside, of course, that it reduces the stock of social housing. Uh, that has obviously become much more of an issue in recent years um, because of the shortage of housing and the high rents that have resulted. And that's prompted the government to encourage um, more social housing. So how to uh, address the um, issue of the reduction of stock is a very big question, but this is maybe one way of doing it. And what I'd like to suggest is that um, a tenant who's exercising the right to buy loses the right to buy the home the tenant occupies, the council-owned property or the housing association-owned property. Instead, the tenant has a right to use the discount for which they're eligible under the current scheme to then buy a home in the private sector. And uh, just to spell out how this would work in practice, the tenant would get a valuation of the home they occupy and, and the amount of the discount for which they're eligible in the way that they do under the current scheme. They then um, choose a property uh, that they wish to buy in the private sector. The council then pays the amount um, equal to the discount towards the price of that property. 
tenant gets a mortgage for the balance in the way that they would do it under the current scheme at the moment. And then the tenant moves out of the council home or the houses association home into a new home in the private sector. Uh, and that's obviously the great benefit of the uh, proposal socially. The council then gets a vacant property back into the housing stock and probably at a lower cost than having to build a new property. Um, because I think the discounted proceeds of sale that the council foregoes uh, are likely to be less than the cost of a new build. And of course, it's much quicker than building a new home afresh. Um, there would be uh, benefits, considerable benefits, I think, for the tenants as well, mainly around um, choice and flexibility. Um, I imagine quite a lot of people who exercise the right to buy are people who want to downsize, perhaps after raising a family. Um, and the advantage for them is that they could get a, a smaller property, um, cheaper property possibly, and that would help reduce the um, issue of under occupation by older people, which I think Simon touches on in the pamphlet as being a problem uh, across the board. Um, and those who can't afford to buy uh, their own, the property they're occupying, and that must surely be the case sometimes in London, would be able to move elsewhere uh, and get a cheaper property, um, either because it's smaller or if it's in a lower cost area. So in that way, it would um, possibly make it, make it possible for more people to exercise the right to buy uh, than are able to do at the moment. And there are obviously um, policy benefits of government as well. It's the policy that one would hope would appeal to both council and tenants, as well as addressing that criticism of right to buy that we've had right from the beginning, that it is taking away uh, homes from the um, affordable section the sector. Um, also, I think it would mean that more people will be able to buy in the long term, as you'd have a tenant exercising the right to buy, uh, moving out and freeing up a home, and then a new tenant would come in and they would have a right to exercise the right to buy in turn, though again in the private sector. So there would be more churn of people uh, who are exercising the right to buy. And um, obviously, we would support that as um, giving uh, people an opportunity to own more people an opportunity to own their home. Um, it might also encourage people to move from high cost areas uh, to lower cost areas. And as I think Simon touched on this, that this could bring benefits to the north where property is cheaper and um, help uh, the leveling up agenda, which um, we all support. Uh, it does raise some big questions, of course, and I suppose the first one is, are there enough homes available in the private sector? And uh, that obviously is a, a question that we ask ourselves about all housing issues, because um, probably everything on housing depends on expanding the supply of housing. And as Bob Blackman pointed out, we are building a lot more houses now, so hopefully there will be room for people to move into the private sector from the public sector. Um, the other issue, big issue, I suppose, is whether tenants will want to buy, still want to buy, if they have to move into the private sector. Um, I guess that needs a bit of market research, probably. Uh, but there are promising indications because some councils do offer cash incentives for people to move out of their council housing into the private sector. So uh, it's not usually um, as beneficial and as generous as the discounts get under right to buy. But despite that, according to Shelter, these schemes are very popular. So that suggests there is an appetite out there for um, people to get out of social housing into private housing. And I suppose the, that brings up the big issue, which is um, should tenants instead be able to choose whether they buy in the private sector or whether they buy their current council home, rather than have, being forced to buy only in the, in the private sector? that would uh, possibly be more less controversial. And um, I think if I'm right in uh, saying that, that that is actually what the pamphlet recommends. Um, even if the more radical option of only being able to buy in the private sector is preferred, it might be as well to uh, run the two together initially to see whether buying in the private sector is likely to appeal to um, council and housing association tenants. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of other issues that have popped into listeners' minds when they have uh, uh, heard about this proposal. Um, so it'd be good to know whether people think this suggested revamp of right to buy would work. 
if it does, uh, it might be one of those rare reforms uh, that is popular with everyone directly affected and saves money as well. Um, so let's hope there's scope for it and appetite for it. So thank you very much, Sir Bob. Thank you very much, Judith. And that, that's really thoughtful and uh, fascinating, I, I think, ideas uh, there. Uh, and then uh, finally, we'll move on to our, to, to our, to our last but not least uh, uh, pa panellists, uh, another solicitor like Judith, uh, Sarah Ball. Uh, and uh, Sarah, of course, you've specialised in commercial property and in property law for uh, a number of number of years now with one of the uh, big firms in, in London. So it's very much your uh, area of expertise from a legal point of view. So over to you. And of course, a former candidate for uh, Vauxhall uh, at the last uh, uh, general election. Next time, too. No, I promise you, Sarah, next time. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, over to you. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, yes, good evening. So as Bob said, I am a commercial property lawyer by day, but I'd say I'm very much approaching this from the topic of uh, viewpoint of friends and family who are trying to get onto the property ladder. Mm -hmm. And as Bob mentioned, I stood as the candidate in Vauxhall at the general election almost to the day uh, last year. Um, and yes, one of the main experiences I had on the doorstep was discussion about housing. Now, having actually spent the majority of this year working from home, I think many of us can appreciate that even more than before, potential homeowners are going to take uh, place a great value or greater value on where they actually live. In the future, our homes are not only going to be the place we spend our evenings and weekends, but potentially substantial parts of our week too. COVID-19 has revolutionised our working practices and has proved that agile working is the future. So more now than ever, we really need to get this issue right. When you think that uh, a one bed residential property in central London can go from being 250,000 pounds in June 20, 2003 and currently be estimated at 850,000 pounds, perhaps you can see the appeal of Sean Bailey, the conservative mayoral candidates, most recent policy proposal of 100,000 shared ownership homes for 100,000 pounds if elected. And whilst I appreciate London has its own peculiarities, that same trend of vastly increased housing prices can be seen across the country. Is it any wonder, therefore, that our current generation are struggling to find the bottom of the ladder, let alone step on the first rung? And this is why this paper is really important in actually trying to find some realistic solutions for more affordable housing, because we do have an inherent issue with intergenerational inequality. I also believe that we have to think very carefully about how these homes are built or if they're going to be relet, and what they will actually look and feel like. Because whilst it's important that we have these properties, we do need to make sure that they are quality builds, because there are numerous examples of developments being riddled for years with repair works being needed. And they also need to be of a quality size, not just a small box, and also have sufficient outside space too. The green agenda is not a flash in the pan. Boris's 10 point plan paves the way, but the message of build back better and the green uh, recovery must now apply to housing too. Just as commercial landlords and tenants are looking to improve the environmental credentials of their properties, so too must the residential sector. And that's not really an area I think that's been tackled yet. We need to think about how hydrogen ready boilers are incorporated, electric charging vehicle points uh, becoming a standard feature and how this housing is developed to fully offer green space around them. We also have to take care to make sure that the affordable housing is truly affordable beyond the initial acquisition, and that first-time buyers are really getting the best advice and deals in these scenarios. I was recently watching a programme which highlighted that even when people are successfully purchasing a shared ownership scheme, there are examples of how service charges have um, more than doubled in the course of a few years from one and a half thousand to nearly four thousand pounds in one example which markedly pushes these homes into an unaffordable category for some and likewise we need to ask that housing associations look associations look into offering a fair length of leases considering perhaps not offering them for longer than 99 years or 125 years there was an example of 80 year leases being sold on shared ownership scheme which for those in the know, after a few years become unfundable without an often expensive lease extension process. So we have a great opportunity in the next few years to make a real difference in the housing sector. And we really must harness this as the now sort of infamous saying goes, you cannot expect people to truly support capitalism when they have no true capital themselves. So now is the time. Thank you. Great. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sarah. That's uh, that, 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 that's brilliant. Uh, so, lots and lots of ideas out there from from, from our very distinguished uh, set of panelists. And uh, uh, thinking about it, some of us can remember when Horace Cutler and the GLC, when George was a member, were pilot, pilot, you know, piloting right to buy on a voluntary basis before the the statutory scheme that uh, Julie referred to uh, came in. Uh, and there's no doubt it it it. it it, it goes deep into the British psyche, doesn't it? Or certainly the English psyche, at any rate, the, the desire to own your own home. And you know, politically, uh, well, one needs to get on the back of, uh, all of that desire and try and find means of delivering it. Um, so, uh, any questions from our, our audience? We've got a, uh, a, a number here. Um, oh. Let me go over. Yeah. Um, let me go over. The first one I have got here um, is actually from Ravi Govindia. Um, Ravi, great to, 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 to see you. Um, Ravi, of course, is the leader of Wandsworth Council um, and uh, themselves have done a great deal in this field uh, and a good chum. So, um, uh, Ravi, you've got an interesting point that you wanted to, 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 to raise. About thank you Bob, this very much. And what this you're is, doing in Wandsworth. Thank you, Bob, for this opportunity. Very thought provoking webinar, really. And I just wanted to comment on Judith Barnes's point about the, the reformed right to buy, as it were. We already operate a house purchase grant. We provide up to £100,000 for somebody in a council house to move out wherever they want to. Um, and it is always oversubscribed. The point is, the limit is the budget. So we have a, a set a budget each year from it, and it comes out of the housing allocations. And, and of course, if your reforms were to go through, I think there would be quite a lot of interest in it. Now, the one thing that I've also wrestled with time and time again is when people want to relocate from this country to the country they came from, perhaps, as they age, the housing purchase grant does not allow that because of all sorts of issues about whether the person will become destitute when they go back home. So there are some restrictions on it. But I would like it to be much more free uh, choice uh, altogether. Uh, just a further comment on Sir, Sir George Young's point about the art, the right to buy receipts. I mean, the one point that is also worth making is the right to buy receipts were by many councils reinvested in better maintaining the stock. Um, so in case of Wandsworth, we spent millions of pounds in actually repairing our housing stock, which had been run down. And that created its own virtuous circle, better maintained stock, created more right to buy interest a more right to buy it created more a sort of sales and more more investment in maintaining better maintaining the stock okay no that's very good points ravi thanks any observations from our panel on on what ravi was was telling us there can, can i make a point George, yeah. um those of us with long memories will remember that in the 1980s we gave a commitment to housing association tenants that they should buy their homes. Mm -hmm. It was thrown out by the House of Lords. And instead we invented, or I invented a scheme called HOCHA, mm -hmm. which was home ownership for tenants of charitable housing associations. Mm -hmm. And it was in fact the portable discounts that we've now been talking about, which Judith Barnes is quite rightly uh, so keen on. And as, as um, Ravi just in, in, implied, the Treasury never liked it. With, with grants for housing associations, they could see the bricks and mortar that were being acquired with the Treasury money. With the portable discounts, which were used to purchase an already existing house, the Treasury couldn't see what they were getting for their money. And so eventually the uh, fuel ran out, the tank, uh, and the scheme fell into disrepute. It was revived. Um, in 2015, we had a manifesto commitment to extend the right to buy to housing association tenants, which was never, uh, which was never delivered. But the portable discount was part of the deal where the housing association could not sell the property because it had been built under section 106. I, I still think it's a great idea. I, I welcome you this support, but the battle is going to be with the treasury for recognizing the point that Judith made that for the a fraction of the price of new builds and at a fraction of the time, you can get a relet for somebody in housing need. Yeah, 
that, that's a very, very important point, I think, Um, you know, Bob, those of us who've been ministers in spending departments all know that actually the, the, the real enemy sometimes isn't the opposition, it's the treasury <laughs> to try and get, to, to, to try and get things done. So I think that's absolutely right. Judith, any thoughts? From, from... I was just going to say in response to Ravi that it's great that Wandsworth uh, runs a house purchase scheme, um, comparable to what I suggested. But um, there are loads of councillors who just wouldn't even contemplate it. And dare I say, yeah. a lot of them would probably be Labour councillors. Um, so I think what I'm suggesting would build on the schemes that councils, uh, some councils are current, currently running by actually making a statutory scheme and making it obligatory. Um, and hopefully that would uh, then replace the current scheme and be up a lot more social housing. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Now, now, Guy, I know you had a, uh, a point you wanted to raise. Yes. We've heard a lot of very interesting points today, not just from the paper, which Simon and Judith in particular contributed with Sarah, but other points as well. And I wondered, this I think would be, would be interesting, to each member of the panel, if you had to ask the government to take one point on board, what would your point be? Okay, this is, who's going to go first? Well, one wish. Yes. One wish. Okay, it's Christmas coming. One wish. Simon. Uh, my wish would be that the government should encourage the introduction of a low cost home ownership scheme on public owned land or through a redesigned land value capture arrangement. So on every large development, such as that's um, being proposed now, which I refer to um, by Peabody in Thamesmead, there should be a number of homes for low cost ownership for people who are buying for the first time. Okay, thanks, Alan. George, any thoughts? Wow. Well, um... Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that I would go for resolving the problems of the tarred locks. Mm. I think it's casting a huge blight, not just over the tarred locks, but over yeah. flats that have got nothing wrong with them at all. I think a political priority that's affecting hundreds of thousands of people, many of them your constituents, yeah. Bob. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that has to be... I know it's not the long-term vision that Simon has uh, quite rightly mentioned, but I think that's... Uh, top of the list at the moment. Uh, that, I, well, I, I, I very much agree, uh, agree with that, George. Particular issue, because you find is where the, the freeholds have been sold on. Um, mm -hmm. Over the years, have ended up in offshore trusts and, uh, and other um, um, yeah. uh, forms of ownership, where, frankly, the, the freeholder doesn't have any real stake uh, in reputation or otherwise in the, uh, in, yeah. in the game. So that's, I think yeah. that's, that's really important. Or the leaseholders have bought the freehold, and the leaseholders sim simply exactly. haven't got the money. Simply, yeah, absolutely, because, you know, they're... They're, they're probably mortgaged anyway, and the, the flats are unmortgageable effectively from, from now on, unsellable too. So that's, that's a real, a real okay. problem. Um, I wanted to tie in on yeah, that. Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. So on, on that point as well, I think another thing I was, was watching is people were saying they, they're trapped at the moment because they can't get the yeah. fill certificates that they need. And so despite yeah. the fact they really do want to move out, yeah. they just can't. And they've been told it could take months, years. Mm. And when you're sort of in this dire stretch where you know you really do need to move and you could get a much better, better quality mm. house outside of London, perhaps even, and you're you're trapped. I think it's something like a real imperative the government needs to focus on now. I think. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right, Judith. Uh, yeah, I mean, apart apart from the right to buy issue, obviously, which is good, dear to my heart, uh, this issue on the cladding is a horrendous issue. I mean, I I find it difficult to understand because um, I don't do the housing law, I guess, why nobody is legally liable for it. And it strikes me that the the government perhaps ought to be looking at the laws to trying to. Uh, obviously, we can't do it retrospectively, but for the future, um, to ensure that those who, are, who did the wrong thing on cladding are actually responsible. Um, apart from that, uh, I think we've, um, through as a result of the COVID crisis, we've really got to grips with a lot of homelessness issues, and I hope the government's going to build on that as well. Okay, I think I mean, I'm going to take your point about trying to get those who are responsible to pay. I suspect maybe we're in a situation because that will take quite a long time to pursue those people. Maybe that government has to be the, the person that steps in up front um, to, to get the innocent leaseholder um, out of an impossible situation. But then, I know you're absolutely right, then we ought to be rigorous about pursuing where we can 
um, uh, of those for whom liability can be you know, made to stick in law. Um, but it's the, the initial thing, I think, is that a real problem for people who are, who are trapped in this, this sort of lose-lose um, situation. Um, got a question now from Derek Joseph. Um, Derek, over to you. Making a couple of comments. One, people said about using REITs. But REITs are a very expensive and transitory way of funding mass housing and only really have been successful in countries that where they don't have institutions that can access the corporate bond markets like um, USA, Japan and Australia. In other countries, the, the, the range of housing has been on the whole done through not-for-profit organizations like housing associations accessing the corporate bond markets and in particular the euro bond markets because it's half, you know, if you look at the REITs, they sort of return four or five percent, maybe six percent per annum. The housing associations borrow the most recent one on the corporate bond markets at about two percent. So yeah. the rents that are necessary to cover the cost and the money that they've got to build is sort of more than double if they go down the bond market. So I, I just think that wouldn't it be sensible to encourage the housing associations provide a wider range of housing than just the affordable housing and maybe even sort of develop a different type of tenure that people could to build to um, as a sort of what used to be called cost rent or cost purchase rather than going for sort of a more complicated um, set of vehicles. Okay. Simon, any thoughts on that? I, I think um, uh, Derek has highlighted uh, the US experience um, and they they have a, a fair mixture of tenants and tenures on some of their developments. Um, he, in fact, introduced the company that I quoted in the text. Uh, but I think that REITs, uh, as he rightly says, they are expensive. Uh, he and I have tried to uh, set up a REIT uh, mm. some years ago, um, and we selected a very well-known uh, uh, merchant bank to provide us with advice. Um, of course, it was um, layman's, and it was some months before they um, disappeared. Um, but the fact is that I think REITs are something that need to be looked at. Uh, and I think if one did have a mixed kind of scheme, then it's one that would work. Um, for example, McCarthy and, McCarthy and Stone, which is one particular area, that uh, is clearly the kind of vehicle that could be used. And I think if housing associations had a wider view of housing, then I think it would certainly be worth, worthwhile uh, exploring uh, but not overlooking the bond market, which is particularly financial, particularly beneficial now. Yeah, that's, 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 that's an interesting point. Well, why is it you think that REITs have never really taken off? I, I puzzled us because we, when we were in opposition in you know, prior to 2010, we kicked the ideas around with the, you know, the various policy groups uh, a lot. And then when we came in uh, into DCLG, we could never actually yeah. get the thing to fly. I think they're very complicated to operate uh, the, uh, and you have to separate uh, some of the functions of the housing management, which adds to the cost. Uh, and I think that's probably the principal reason. But if we could get, as, uh, as Lord Young suggested, much more pension uh, investment in all forms of residential uh, let on sorry, private rented and social rented, then I think we could get REITs rather better off the ground. Yeah. One of the things I was being keen to try and do is to encourage some of our, our old friends in local government with their pension schemes uh, to think about more investment in that. And that's sometimes a struggle. Our own um, local council's pension scheme is very well run and they're reluctant to join in in the sort of the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, common investment vehicles that we've now. Uh, set up to try and get critical mass. Association bonds. Yeah. 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 Bond. yeah, yeah, bond. yeah. Rather thought, than Derek. commercial property. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you look at the way Croydon have caught such a cold over um, doing commercial property um, investments not terribly well. No, um, you, you think actually much much better used to go into the housing into the housing stock. Indeed, and it is ironic that you know some Canadian pension funds are some of the biggest investors. Um, in the field in the UK. So I think it's more work for us to do that. Any other thoughts from, on Derek's point? No, I, 
No arms open. I've got to say, I, on a lighter note, I went and opened one of those McCarthy and Stone retirement uh, uh, schemes in in, in Chislehurst, just down the road from me. The uh, um, last year, and anything that miffed me a bit was when I was leaving. They said, "Thank you very much for coming on and, and opening." And would you like to take one of our brochures? I've not got me. <laughs> Lucky they let you out. Yeah, we absolutely got. I was a bit worried about that, I tell you. But, <laughs> right. Um, uh, Guy, you've got another, uh, another question. Um, uh, I know that in Wandsworth, LNG, Legal and General, are mm -hmm. developing a big site, um, which was a BMQ site or home base, I can't remember which. And um, I did wonder whether the big pension providers might have access to less, well, cheaper money than the REIT. And of course, what they're looking for um, is long-term income streams yeah. from which to pay pensions. Yeah. Um, I just wondered whether that's a sort of something to be encouraged. Um, yeah. I don't know whether Ravi is still around and whether he yeah. have a view on this. Well, you're, you're, yeah, I mean, you'll be aware of that, Ravi, won't you? Phil? Thanks. Okay. I mean, Guy's absolutely right. It, it is the BMQ site where LNG yeah. are doing a, a, a private rentals uh, yeah. flat. Uh, they have permission for it, and they're on the site. We, in fact, also have Grangers interested in uh, doing yeah. a similar scheme yeah. in around Batsy Power Station. So there's a fair amount of interest, but what I have found in my conversations with uh, developers uh, interested in, in that private market uh, rentals is that it's got to be in the right location for mm. the kind of market they are looking yeah. for. Now, some of them are now worried that in the post-COVID world, mm. will that still work? Because they were looking at a kind of two-bedroom flat for a city mm. professional who wanted to live in London, not very far from a railway station or something like that, sure. and to be able to both, both, both get into work and so on. Will that market still be there is the kind of question yeah, that right. remains hanging. Yeah, no, so that, that, so that, that, that's, so that's certainly a, a, a fair point. Um, it, Simon, yeah. Um, interestingly, the amount of um, uh, private rented properties being going up um, and uh, becoming quite significant at the moment, um, we, my firm acts for one particular entity, which uh, I can't talk about, but they are investing money into the private rented sector. Um, I used to act for the legal general when uh, in my previous firm and they were beginning to explore that and they've recently announced they're spending another 250 million on yet more residential property. They are very cautious and therefore I'm not surprised in a sense they're actually going forward to look at uh, uh, purchasing more residential property um, because that it, I think is a much safer investment, dare I say it, than perhaps commercial properties at the moment because housing is needed, housing is always going to be needed um, of whatever kind. And I think having good quality landlords is only going to benefit the sector and therefore the pension fund and the pensioners who are benefiting from that fund. Yeah, that's a well-made point, I must say. That's a, and I can, I can certainly, I've seen that sort of growth in private sector um, in places like the centre of Bromley because you're 20, you know, 20 minutes into Victoria Indeed. Um, uh, and that's exactly the sort of area if you pitch it right um, the, 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 there'll be a market. Um, uh, Ravi thanks for coming, Ravi's uh, off now but many thanks for, 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 for your input uh, and uh, Jonathan Norton's got a question as well, Jonathan. Uh, hi, hello everyone, um, I, Simon Randall knows me, the rest of you don't, I help contribute to the report. Um, presumably you can hear me. Um, yeah, I can hear you fine, Jonathan. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, 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 my, my point was um, on a slightly different topic, yeah. um, generating new development and the, the affordability of private for sale housing. Yeah. Because obviously land values generally um, require that the sale price of private housing is as expensive. So the issue is the, the lack of retention of value um, through the system because there's no obligation on local authorities to retain it. And land value is the thing that is used by you know, Homes England particularly yeah. and, and by government in order to generate volume. So you get volume, you get ever increasing private for sale to help fund affordable. Yeah. There are massive infrastructure deficits. The National Audit Office estimated in their wonderful report of February 19, a deficit of about 30,000 a house. Um, 
And when you look at the you know 200,000 houses that were built mm. in that report, that's a, a six billion deficit. Yeah. If we're reaching 300,000, that would be a, a nine billion deficit. And that excludes strategic infrastructure, which is what's required to make yeah, it sure. sustainable. So it, it's a question of management across mm. departments. I've had first-hand experience of failing no, to get Department of Transport and HLG to work together. Yeah. even with support of Treasury on these issues. But I, I think it is, you know, there's a, there's a political issue which is hiding its yeah. value because yeah. it's used to generate volume. Whereas the, the new planning paper does yeah. suggest that that could be targeted, but then we've had SIL, which would have enabled yes, land to be right priced down to whatever value um, is required. And that hasn't yeah. been used. So I don't know. Those with more political antennae than I understand yes. the picture, um, would there be support to make the capturing of land value um, a statutory obligation? It's certainly been one of those topics that's been uh, kicked around, hasn't it, in policy discussions for, 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 for many years by people actually both on left and right. Um, mm. it, it, huge it, it, amounts it of misunderstandings. Um, yeah. It's a debate rather curious most of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, no, 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 no. no. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. I know Dave Wetzel, when he was, we were some of us remember from the GLC days, was very keen on pushing it from a, um, a, a rather left wing perspective. But I think you can, as yeah, you say, make a much more market case for it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Any, any observations on, on Jonathan's point? It's, it is. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure that still will not stay in, as it is indefinitely, I suspect. There's, there's, there's always bound to be some forms of. Uh, of reform it's uh, something that uh, sort of grew when we were in in 28 as you know from mm. 2010 through, through through to 15 um uh, and if i could come back on that i mean the progress do you think yeah yeah come on Jonathan, Look, yeah. i mean the white paper um brings in something called nil yeah which is sort of it's a misnomer the idea is it would capture um land mm. in the same way as sill would but on a national yeah. basis yeah that's right. like lots of allowances um but the, you know, the current paper does enable this to happen. Um, but as I say, the previous planning regime and, and SIL did as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the difficulty is in governmental management across departments. I mean, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a, 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 a big topic in itself. We'd have a seminar on that, I suspect, if we wanted to. I mean, hmm. SIL was done on an localised basis to try and act as an incentive. A bit like new homes bonus in a different way, trying to incentivise local authorities to do the development on the basis that they have something to pay for the infrastructure costs. But, um, some have been more willing to, to adopt that approach than others for other reasons, I suspect, rather than purely the, the, the financial ones. But it's sometimes a convenient, convenient reason if you don't want to build uh, in your area. And I think we've got to look, I would argue, Perhaps more more broadly, indeed, uh, overall, that the whole way in which we um, finance local government as we go forward, um, because something that's Absolutely. based upon, you know, uh, rateable value, yeah, business rates, for example, and recycled in various ways, is going to have to adapt and change, isn't it? As the nature of business um, uh, changes and the number of uh, business heritagements, uh, as Simon was saying, only declines. I think it. It feeds into a bigger piece about how do we uh, how, how do we fund local government and how do we link that to uh, key mm -hmm. things like housing provision. Any other um, points and questions for our for our panel? Jonathan Holly there now, now I think yeah John over to you. Thank thank you Sir Bob and, and good evening and uh, I also played a very small uh, part in the paper uh, and joined my discussions with Simon but from an asset management perspective and yeah. uh, I'm a councillor. Uh, at night and a housing lawyer by day and I come at it from a, a property management perspective and what is interesting with uh, the we see the white paper recently published we see the building safety bill and we see the direction of travel in terms of building safety and the increased role of a regulator around tenants and residents being safe in their own homes now that comes at a cost and we see that the case law uh, out of the sphere is about passing on those costs as increased service charges to residents. So I'm just interested in the panel's view of how we square that circle between the importance, indeed the very importance of building safety on the one hand and the cost of it being borne by the residents themselves through, through the service charge uh, costs that we see the courts uh, deciding upon. 
Thank you. Yeah, okay, Jonathan, that's, 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 that's a very good point. Um, uh, Sarah, any thoughts on that from a, a property lawyer's point of view? And it, it is it is a very difficult balance to strike. So I think I appreciate from a landlord's perspective, they're always looking to to make sure that they can sort of, as they said, pass the cost on. But as I said from from this program, when when it becomes a point that it's uh, sort of unrealistic and so you're going to levels where you know service charges is doubling, I think there definitely does need to be something. I think um, I think it's also slightly become incumbent on lawyers as well to make sure that actually the tenants realise what they're getting into in the in these situations because I think sometimes some tenants perhaps aren't especially if you know in certain housing developments sort of aware of the fact that the, there aren't caps necessarily on these service charges um I mean it is it is a very difficult one to balance I think there was an example as well I've heard of this sort of there was da significant damage on this shared ownership scheme and one particular lady said she found she was had a bill for up to twenty thousand pounds which of course just is just not feasible not realistic um i sort of maybe defer to some of the other panelists to see if they have another idea but it is it is definitely one that we've got to try and square yeah. as you said yeah a a any thoughts um mm. any takers for any uh, uh, other answers to jonathan's fair well fair point um, George. again digging into one's um long-term memory there was a problem when um leaseholders under the right to buy mm. bought their flats and then they were confronted with a huge service charge by the local authority landlord for new lifts or new roof or whatever, which hadn't been revealed when they, when they bought. And again, I, I think the government then intervened and we mm. capped the service charge for a certain number of years after yeah. purchase. Now, the background was different. They had uh, exercised uh, the right to buy under a government policy. And therefore, yeah. I think we felt we had some sort of moral obligation to, to safeguard the policy and yeah. stop it from coming. But so, again, there is a precedent uh, for, for the government intervening and capping service charges where the, a, a strong political case had yeah. been made. Now, in those cases, of course, by definition, the landlord was the local authority, whereas uh, what we're talking about now, the landlord is almost certainly not the local authority. So there's a difference there. But nonetheless, the, the, the principle is that the government stepped in to protect mm. leaseholders who had done nothing wrong from, uh, yeah. from hardship. Yeah, OK. And I think for those of us who are classic Tories, that's not a legitimate um, a stance mm. for, a, yes. a, a, for, for a government to take. It's pragmatism. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's, hopefully that's back in vogue. <laughs> right. Um, any, Simon, yeah, thoughts? Um, I think my uh, thoughts are that, um, and this is perhaps moving slightly off the point, yeah, sure. I think the intergenerational issues mm. for young people is going to be a very key nettle that has to be grasped because there are lots of young people who aspire to buying their own home that 50 years ago they could have done with considerable ease. Now it is so difficult, as Sarah has outlined, and I think that's something that the party needs to concentrate on uh, with enormous vigour. And I think that has to be done throughout England. Um, uh, and I'm, I think we need to think about it up in uh, all parts of the country, uh, because I think if we can give young people, those starting up uh, for the first time, the opportunity of buying their own home, uh, the bank of mum and dad is uh, not as uh, full as it might be, and is certainly not going to be as full as it should be in some years hence. So I think that is something that the party needs to grapple with, uh, and they have grapple with it quickly. Yeah. I think that's a fair point that inter intergenerational fairness is a really critical thing, I think, for our, our long term future. Well, look, um, that's been really helpful. I don't see any other questions that people um, are seeking to, to raise at the moment. So I just wanted to thank uh, all of our panel uh, for their time. Uh, it's been absolutely brilliant, fascinating discussion, um, really very useful. Um, so many thanks to, 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 to all of you for joining us. And yeah, if you haven't already done so already, please go and read the pamphlet because um, it's, it's a very, very worthwhile um, contribution. Uh, and uh, you can find out about this and lots of other of our work with the Society. There we are. Sarah's, Sarah's got it there to do the plug. Well done. That's brilliant. Uh, and it's kind of, we've had it all nicely printed up as well. Pretty good, yeah. And uh, good to see you all. Uh, but do keep on the website, because Guy will be updating us with more work that we're going to be doing uh, just in the new year, aren't we, Guy? I think we've got, got, got plenty more to come.
Indeed. I've, I've got various ideas. They're not housing, I'm afraid. But, um, anyway. No, but great. But, but pl plenty more to come. And Ed, thank you again for looking after all the technical side of things. And uh, uh, if we don't see any of you before, have a, have a great Christmas. Uh, and uh, uh, let's hope things can only get better uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, yeah. uh, in the new year. So let's hope for that. Stay well, stay safe. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.